Good morning and welcome to the daily space for today, Thursday, March 19th, 2020. We are going out 30 minutes earlier than normal and I'm realizing I totally forgot to tweet about that. I'm actually going to pause and tweet about that. Do I have my phone? Now, the reason that we're coming out so early is because we're going to go straight from our daily space coverage into watching a NASA town hall that is going to be streamed by the United, sorry, by the University Space Research Align, Association. Um, they are covering what would have been the normal NASA town hall at the Lunar and Planetary um, Space Conference, except that conference got canceled like so many other things. So while well, the NASA Town Hall is important because it's our chance to, well, find out exactly what NASA wants us to be working on, because if we write proposals and things for stuff that they don't want us to be working on, we're not going to get funded. It also helps us understand the long-term goals as they constantly change and the limitations that are going to be on us with the current predicted budgets. Without the town hall, we are all running with a little less information. So USRA is going to do what they can to get that content out, and we're going to do what we can to stream it here on twitch.tv. Um, so Daily Space is starting early, so we can, oops, can have a watch party for a... NASA Town Hall at the normal daily space, 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 space. Why won't you type space? All right. It really wanted to complete to daily sports. So join now at twitch.tv slash I hate being allergic to dust Cosmic Quest X. I'm going to sneeze at some point just to let you know. <coughs> okay. All right. So um, now that I have tweeted that out, Hello and welcome to this special early edition of The Daily Space for today, Thursday, March. How is it already March 19th, 2020? I am your host, Dr. Pamela Gay, and I am here to put science in your brains. Um, today's news is full of stories that are taking all sorts of turns for the unexpected. Mistakes uh, may be made in presenting coverage of the first story, which is not actually the image that is up on the screen. Um, and and we're still going to try and bring you the story so that you can laugh along with us. Over the past decade or so, researchers have realized that slime molds are better at mapping how to get between point A and point B than just about anything else. Um, build a tiny city with slime, slime mold food as the buildings. The slime mold will figure out the best possible delivery route between the buildings. Build a map with, with food marking out the positions of the cities. Slime molds will happily design highway routes for you. Slime molds, um, they're really good at out optimizing paths. And all these little single-celled organisms work together to do this. This is not a single smart entity. This is a whole bunch of single-celled individuals that work together to create these, well, dendritic paths. Um, I don't know how slime molds do this. I actually have no idea how slime molds do this. And I'm not sure anyone fully understands 
the path optimizing abilities of slime molds. But sometimes what you don't understand, you can still figure out how to replicate with a computer. And a lot of computer scientists for the past decade or so have been working to develop algorithms that imitate the pathfinding abilities of slime molds. Now, slime molds is not something that I would ever have expected to cover here on The Daily Space. Um, that said, when I read the headline, Astronomers Use Slime Mold to Map the Universe's Large Scale Structure, I had to stop and read. So here's first of all why someone would have thought that this is a good idea. Um, the algorithms that they use and the slime molds themselves, when they're creating their paths between points, create this dendritic finger-like pattern that we're used to only seeing in things like trees rivers as they flow through estuaries and form deltas and in the large scale structure of the universe. And it turns out as our universe formed, it gravitationally collapsed from a mostly smooth cloud of, well, stuff, atoms and energy. And as it collapsed, it, well, formed dust first, but then went on after forming dust and molecules to go ahead and form galaxies, clusters of galaxies, walls of galaxies. And all these massive large scale structures of our universe came about from how gravity from the slight over densities pulled and twisted and worked together to well, create places where stuff was more likely to form. The well, least energy path between these different gravitational masses. Our large scale structure is a dendritic shape. So because this is all driven by gravity, you end up with these cool gravitational potentials that map the shortest paths between the biggest clusters. Knowing that is awesome. Mapping that is really hard. So we went from knowing that the universe is shaped out thanks to gravity into these shortest path gravitational potential dendritic shapes between the galaxy clusters, the galaxy walls, to not fully knowing how to predict what shape these forms would take because, well, modeling this is hard. And this is where the slime mold comes in. Slime has our back on this mapping. To be clear, much to my disappointment, scientists did not create a physical map of galaxies and let the slime mold connect the model galaxies. Um, when I read that headline, astronomers use slime mold to map the universe's large scale structures. I had so much hope that actual slime mold would be involved. No, slime mold computer algorithms were involved. Um, no, actual slime mold. Using these algorithms and data from the digital sky survey, um, the team provided the slime mold algorithm, the positions of myriad galaxies and had the slime mold algorithm figure out what paths through the galaxies the large scale structure should be taking. They asked the slime mold in the software to trace out the dendritic structure of our universe using the galaxies as, as the cities along which the paths would form. Now, once the slime mold algorithm had mapped out where the large scale structure should be, they then used archival data from the Hubble Space Telescope to figure out if that's where the large scale structure, structure actually is. And it turned out they were able to confirm the slime molds results. Um, they used the light of 350 distant quasars to illuminate the places between us and the quasars, the large scale structure stretches. And as they looked through this data, um, it matched. And the really cool thing about using software instead of actual slime mold 
because software can work in three dimensions. Actual slime mold just crawls across surfaces, and if it burrows in, that's really hard for us to figure out how to deal with. Although, I have to admit, in writing this story, I had fantasies of like taking something like aerogel, which I think slime mold should be able to climb through, and using syringes to put blobs of food inside this three-dimensional aerogel structure, and letting the slime mold do its three-dimensional thing, but I don't know if this would work. I am, after all, an astrophysicist. But I'd like to try this. These are the things I sometimes think about while preparing for this show. All right, so using their software, they mapped out the three-dimensional structure of the universe based on how slime mold would build it, tested it using Hubble Space Telescope data, and discovered the slime mold got it right, or at least the slime mold based algorithm got it right. All of this can be found in new research published by J. Barchette and company in the Astrophysical Journal Letters. We have links on dailyspace.org. And if you know more about biology than I do, which is most of you, um, I really encourage you to go take a look at this. It is delightful research. All right, from this tale of cross-disciplinary awesome, we now jump to another story of things going sideways. Um, in this case, we actually mean things went sideways. A new star has been identified that is a pulsating variable star, but only half of it is a pulsating variable star. Yes, folks, half of the star is behaving. The other half is also behaving, but its behavior is to pulsate but only half of the star. Um, in a binary system with a delta scuti variable star and a red dwarf star, the gravity of the tiny red dwarf is able to distort the 1.7 solar mass delta scuti type pulsating variable in such a way that only half the star undergoes its normal pulsations. Um, the regular brightening, brightening and dimming of a delta scuti variable is only seen in certain orientations of this binary system. This system was spotted in data from the TESS spacecraft, which is looking for transiting exoplanets and is super sensitive to variations in brightness. And um, this is one of those stories that goes to show that one scientist's noise, this is not an exoplanet. Well, that one scientist's noise is another scientist's data. According to Don Cutts of University of Central Lancaster, I've been looking for a star like this for nearly 40 years, and now we have finally found one. Gerald Handler of the Nicholas Copernicus Astronomical Center adds, the exquisite data from the test spacecraft meant that we could observe variations in brightness due to the gravitational distortion of the star as well as the pulsations. As we perform more and more sur- Sorry? That is a reminder that in 15 minutes I should be recording the Daily Space, but as we said, this is a special episode coming out early. All right, continuing on. Um, this, this research is a reminder that as we perform more and more surveys of our universe, as we use telescopes to, well, look for specific kinds of different things, we're going to turn up other stuff, other stuff that is rare and hard to find and awesome that is all appearing in the noise of somebody else's research. Now, um, this wasn't the only case of a survey pulling up the weird and rare. And in this case, the researchers um, just threw up a illustration of, well, their telescope looking at a binary system because the data itself was kind of meh. So we're not going to show it to you. So this is another case of one survey finding the hard to find in a new paper in Nature by Tri Nature Astronomy, actually, by Truad and company, they were able to identify a pair of close binaries that were made up of two brown dwarf stars. So we have two brown dwarfs that are going around and around one another. And while this system isn't likely to have life, which is the kind of system that the system that found it, Speculos, is designed to find, 
it's still the first binary brown dwarf star system ever found. So not the stuff the this, this survey was looking for, but still awesome. This system is super cool, literally. Um, these stars have failed and are just barely radiating as they glow from the combination of heat from their compressed gas and residual heat from the days when they burned heavy hydrogen. This particular system is even more interesting because the stars are precisely aligned so that they eclipse each other, one passing directly in front of the other allowing us to measure the timing and the way the eclipses take place so that we can precisely measure the, the star's size, the stars, and I'm saying plural stars with then the exclamation mark or apostrophe rather. We can measure both stars mass and both stars radius and we've never been able to do that accurately with brown dwarfs before and this is giving us the best data to date on the nature of these tiny and really hard to find, not quite stars. Now, unfortunately, that data is currently behind a paywall on nature astronomy. And while I pay for nature, I don't also pay for nature astronomy, and I could not access that information. What I can tell you from the press release is in addition to finding these two eclipsing binary stars, they discovered that these two close together stars actually have a third companion that is also a brown dwarf star, um, making this brown dwarfs all the way down. So um, yeah, I'm going to try and find someone who has access to this research paper but for now, we know we have found a small commune of failed stars hanging out in the not-so-distant universe. And that rounds out our show for today. Um, as part of keeping all of us occupied during these strange times, I just want to let you know, in case you haven't been here, um, for the insane streaming that is now taking place, we're working to bring you more and more content live right here on twitch.tv slash CosmoQuestX. Annie and I work from home. This, this is my normal office. Well, here and in a comfortable chair sitting beside a radiator where it's a bit warmer. This is normal for us and we want to share our how we science from home in isolation on a regular basis with all of you who are still trying to figure out this crazy new reality we live in. As part of doing this, we're going to now be doing coffee hours at 9 a.m. Central, 10 a.m. Eastern, that is 7 a.m. Pacific, each morning as we ease into our day and figure out what all is new out there. Well, waiting to be studied. And we also look at silly things that are necessary to help our brains wake up. We are going to be bringing you talks from scientists who can't give their talks because the conferences they were going to were canceled. There will be two of those this afternoon starting at 3 p.m. Eastern. We are starting in 10 minutes live coverage of a NASA town hall meeting. We're going to bring it all to you. And together we're going to get through these new and crazy times one crazy moment at a time. Now I'm going to answer your questions. Um, I'm going to switch how my view appears so that I can also begin setting up for our next stream. All right, so what all do I have going on over here? Um, so <laughs> Binary Blaze is saying, I need silly videos to get through life right now. And that is okay. We all do. Um, I read silly books. So Cos um, Cosmic Star Dream writes, I missed the first part of this show, so in case you don't discuss it, what are the chances any individual can miss catching COVID-19? Okay, so, so um, switching hats. Caveat, I am an astrophysicist who talks with my hands and hits my mic sometime. This means that I understand the math, I understand the statistics, I 
understand the concepts that go into population studies. I, however, got those skills from studying populations of stars in dwarf steroidal galaxies and studying populations of galaxies in galaxy clusters that include over densities of radio galaxies. This is my research background. Okay, so based on the statistics, what we're looking at is roughly one in 300 Americans dying of coronavirus. One in 300 dying. Best case, current models based on current behaviors. For each one person that dies, there are roughly 50 other people who have been infected. So that means we're looking at 51 people in 300 getting sick. Best case, current models. Other models are leaning to more like 80 people in 100 getting sick. Uh, 80 people in 100 is the same thing as 4 in 10. So um, 4 in 10 is also the same thing as 2 out of 5 people. So look around you. Now, of the people who get sick, the way the math currently breaks down is 1 in 300 die. Sucks. Um... Of those who actually get sick, it's expected that 20% are probably going to need hospitalization. So when you hear people talking about 80% of the cases are mild, that means don't need to be hospitalized. 20% will need to be hospitalized. Now the 1% death rate is based on the concept that everyone who needs to be put on a ventilator can get put on a ventilator. Our country doesn't have enough ventilators which is where the worst case models have more like one in a hundred to one in 50 people dying. Um, This is why people talking about flatten the curve. It's a matter of, we're currently looking at Italy as following the same trend line that we follow, where they didn't isolate people. People like to socialize, people like to go out to crowded marketplaces. And it was only after wide swaths of the population had become carriers that they realized, oh shit, we need to lock everyone in their houses. Now, there's a number of big differences between us and Italy. The ones that are relevant here is Italy has significantly more hospital beds than we do. They have um, something like, oh man, I can't remember. For I can't remember the exact numbers. I know that for every nine beds they have, we have between four and six, depending on where you are in the United States. So you have significantly more hospital beds. Because they don't have a for-profit medical system, no one worries about spending profit, excess money they have on buying extra equipment. So they have more respirators per bed than we do. Um, Because they don't have a for-profit system, more people go to the doctor when they start to get sick instead of waiting to go to the doctor when they're super sick. The other factor that is going to play in is Americans tend to have a higher obesity rate, which is linked to a higher rate of diabetes. Um, There's new research that is showing that having diabetes um, and having higher blood sugar in general, which occurs as you get older. This, their thinking is the reason that we're seeing major differences between children getting sick and adults getting sick. So people who have poor blood sugar are like more likely, it appears early research, to have worse outcomes with COVID. Um, other um, counter indicators are lung damage that allows the disease to get hold of your lungs more effectively, heart disease, the same proteins it's affecting in the heart, it's also in the lungs, it's also affecting in the heart, liver, and kidneys, um, and uh, having immune issues, which is always an issue. Um, as someone who has lung issues and uh, a corrupted immune system, I haven't left my house since February 28th. I'm not planning to leave my yard for a long time. 
But this channel is actually here to try and escape this hellscape that we all live in. So I'm happy to answer your questions. I'm happy to try and explain the math and the statistics behind what's going on. Um, but I'm, I'm going to look and see if there's more questions while I set up for the NASA stream that starts in like five minutes, probably. Um, <laughs> so Larry Weird asks, I missed the license number. Is there a license for the system of brown dwarfs? Yes. Um, let me pull up my notes. I didn't put it in my notes because it was even longer than normal. And I was just like, no, I, I don't want to say that out loud. That's a lot. Um, just a second. I'm logging into where I keep all my notes. I'm a Trello user. We actually organize the daily space using Trello um, where uh, there's a really cool plugin where you can fling things from your email into Trello cards. And... Um, so I have happily flung all of today's stories into Trello cards. So the system is 2MassWJ15104782-28182. To repeat, the name of the system that has two eclipsing brown dwarf stars and one, um, well, more distant brown dwarf star is 2 mass. 2-M-A-S-S-W-J-1-5-1-0-4-7-8-2-8-1-7-8. Okay. Um, so Astro YYZ asks, regarding the mold slime, is it fractal? I think dendritic patterns are actually different than fractal patterns, but I, I don't know. I now need to look that up. I don't know. Um, Veronica asks, did you say a commune of failed stars was found? Yes, I did say that. I, I, I don't know what the collective, uh, noun is for a group of three brown dwarfs. And I decided a commune was a perfectly good collective noun for three failed stars. Um, so Paranor's reporting that yeah there there are stories of shared ventilators already there was a group of engineers at a hospital that realized their hospital only had nine ventilate only had two ventilators and they already needed it for more than two people and so they jury rigged the hoses so that it could support nine people across the two machines um, and it's fairly trivial to make one machine support four people, but that means none of them are getting the correct pressure of air. So you can do it and it's better than nothing. Um, so Log Adder asks, I wonder if Elon is already building a ventilator factory. So here's the thing. Um, in California, either yesterday or sometime this week, it's all a blur. Uh, California said that all non-essential businesses were required to close and Elon decided his Tesla factory was a required essential facility. And instead of closing down his factory as a non-essential business, he kept going until law enforcement showed up to shut down. Um, so yeah, yeah, he's actually really much a coronavirus denier. Ah. Uh. Okay, okay. I, I'm really going to set up for for the USRA thing. Hold on, hold on. I'm going to do this before we do anything else. US, uh, I need that link. Uh, 